at New Life Fifth Gong Avenue in Nairobi, and we welcome you to the lesson discussion. We are uh, going to uh, spend a few moments to study the Word of God once again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, with me here is a wonderful panel, as always. I'd like them to introduce themselves and say hello, after which uh, Brother Frank is going to give us a prayer. We're starting from this side. Yes, good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy I'm Masi Odiwur. Once again, I'm happy to be here. Let's study the word of God together. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Frank Capio, and uh, I want to welcome you as we study God's word. And uh, before we begin, let's bow down for a word of prayer. Father Divine, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you for having guided us through the week. And even as we want to discuss upon your word, may your spirit uh, lead us in all these things, that all that you're going to learn today, Lord, on how to minister to the needy, that, Father, we might apply this into our lives. For this, I'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. My name is Ongala Morris. I will be the moderator today, and we welcome you. Uh, first, I would like us to start by a recap uh, of last week's lesson. And last week was aptly talking about mission to the needy. Mission to my neighbor, sorry. Mission to my what? My, my neighbor. neighbor. And for the whole, um, for the whole uh, uh, quarter, we have been examining the theme of God's mission as our own mission, taking God's mission as our own mission. So, Sister Mercy, uh, what did you learn last week? What was your take home last week? Just as a recap. Yes, it was so interesting just uh, to remember that we are on God's mission and uh, we have been called upon to minister unto our neighbor. And what I realized that a neighbor is, uh, is someone who is in need of Christ and mostly for the salvation of the soul. Christ desire is that every soul to be saved. Amen. So a neighbor is anyone in need. And we saw the story of the, the Good Samaritan. And when that lawyer was trying to grill the, the, the Lord and ask him, who is my neighbor? And, and then he burst into the story, the parable of the good, the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and, and we realized that that person who was in need, even though he was not physically close or living closely to those who were attending to him, he was actually considered a neighbor, anyone in need. What was your take home, Frank? Yes, a, when you look at the lawyer, uh, Christ, you know, he's tempting Christ with a question and he's very skeptical about what, you know, Christ is teaching. And even for us, when you go out, uh, you know, when we reach out to our family members and those that are close to us, sometimes they might not even appreciate uh, the need uh, for us ministering to them and uh, that we desire for them to know Christ. Yes. But uh, Christ did not dismiss the lawyer. He still went ahead and, you know, it, it gave them an illustration through the story of the Good Samaritan. And so for us as well, even as we go out, we should have uppermost uh, that the people will understand God through a reading of his word. And even though they do not appreciate him now, uh, then as good neighbors, we've done our part yeah. and we've reached out to them. And that is what God is calling us to to speak the truth, regardless of whether people receive it or not. Thank you. There's also the aspect of unconditionality of our service. You know, some people think that I was only called to serve this type of people. I was called to minister to this type of people and not this other type of people. We do not need to segregate or discriminate against those uh, to whom we minister based on their, the color of their skin, you know, the languages that they speak, or, you know, their geographical location, where they hail from, and so on and so forth. We need to be give unconditional service. And that does it for our lesson. If you didn't watch the last week's uh, lesson, we urge you to go to our YouTube, uh, New Life Faith Day Church YouTube channel to uh, praise yourself with the discussions therein. Uh, today, we are looking at a very interesting theme. And uh, we are looking at mission to the needy. And in my mind, when I read this topic, when I first came across this topic, in my mind I thought that everyone is needy. Everyone in this world is needy. Everyone is in need of something. Even the richest, uh, who you would think have it all together, they are also in need of something. Then how do we define the needy? And I want, us to, I want someone to just give me that description, that definition before we go on. I don't know who's going to do it. Frank, do you want to do it? Who is the needy? Just give me in a few words, who is the needy? 
Yeah, you 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 you've spoken well that you know there are people who will always uh in wherever we are all of us regardless of you know whether we are materially endowed or uh, we are we are sort of like uh, lacking in terms of you know the provisions of life we still have something that we lack you know Christ uh, talking to the to the rich young ruler you know he told him one thing thou lackest but then in this context uh the kind of uh, need that we are talking about is a different kind of need i remember during uh, covid-19 uh, during the pandemic and uh, there was a black uh, lives matter movement that was happening in the us and uh, it was a campaign for you know like equal rights civil rights for like black people and uh, there you could hear you know like uh, white people people of you know like uh, of the white race some of them saying they the white lives also matter but in that context they were missing uh, the actual message of of the campaign that in our cities you know in our churches in our countries there are those people who are always in need uh, for our courage people who need us to stake our reputation uh, for their protection there will be people who you know it's popular to demonize them it's popular to stereotype them and these are the kind of people that you know like we are being asked to stand up for these are the people that are needy thank you very much as a matter of fact christ's mission was centered around this kind of needy people not the needy popular people but the needy unpopular people and popular because of their lifestyles and popular because of their profession look at um, uh, you know lazarus not lazarus but um, Zacchaeus the tax collector yes. the short guy uh, he, he his his profession made him so unpop up unpopular so marginalized so marginalized so segregated so looked down upon and 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 everyone thought he was a sinner they actually called you know publicans and sinners were always called in one they described in one sentence as publicans and and sinners and they were wondering this man even mingles and interacts with publicans and sinners and tax collectors and and those are the kind of people look at uh, Mary Magdalene for example the harlot yes. yeah jesus uh, uh raised his his is 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 his head after he had written on the ground one and and those guys read their sins one by one and they ran away and he asked her where are your accusers then he told her neither do i condemn you go and do what sin and no sin more. no more this is the mission that christ is calling us to it requires boldness as brother frank is uh, is uh, rightly paul pointing out if we are weak and um weak in spirit i mean not weak physically but in spirit or if we are not resolute you know let me just say if we are not converted you know you know because the kind yes. of courage we want here is the courage that comes with conversion it's not a courage of tough headedness it's not the courage of uh, you know you know um standing up firm for our rights no it's a, the courage of knowing that christ has gone ahead of you and yours is only to to execute his his bidding um would you like to tell us yeah, more yeah. about the needy in your own lens? <laughs> yeah, in my own lens, for sure, we are all needy in one way or the other. And what what came into my mind at this particular incident is how Christ was reaching out. Mission is reaching out. You don't just sit where you are, but you reach out and to the need of someone. For example, physical need emotional need health need we are being called upon to go out go out so that we may we may reach reach out so that we might we might be of help to the needs of the people in the society so this kind of people might be the orphans even the those who are hungry the widows the widowers and in so doing we are going to accomplish Christ mission yeah thank you um and the, the other key thing that we need to underscore there before we go to the next section is the fact that this mission is actually um did you say it doesn't segregate that's right but it it it, it we are supposed to focus even on strangers you know yes. on people who are not personally known to us um people who we would we do not know what they struggle with how many times have you seen people who you think your instincts tell you that this person might be in need but just because you don't know them yeah. yeah just because you don't know them you don't know the language they speak you you tend to shy off and 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 because we live also in a in a in a world that is full of uh, so many uh, you know 
uh, deceit, you may fail to trust that person and you know just get closer to them. But we are called to draw draw closer to strangers and inquire. Be interested. You know, make an inquiry of how what they're doing, how they're doing, what their life is about, and and see how we can plug in. And, and use the Christ's method that we are going to examine earlier, later in this, in this discourse. Um, did you want to say something more before we go to the faith of our friends? Yes, I think uh, when we look at uh, the ministry to the needy, the Bible reminds us that uh, the needy will never cease from out of the land. You know, when you look at uh, Deuteronomy 15 verse 11, it tells us that, that the needy will never cease from the land. And also Christ confirms that in the book of John 12, verse 8. He says, you know, the needy you always have with you all the time. And the needy people can be, you know, as a result of uh, things like, you know, misfortune. It could be as a result of sickness. There could be like loss of property and all that. But then uh, Deuteronomy 14, 29 also still goes ahead and says, you know, it talks about uh, even the Levite, you know, the people who are on God's work. Uh, when the Levites, you know, they didn't have inheritance. And so God, God uh, apportioned that they, they should get blessing from the people of God. Then it also goes ahead and talks about, you know, the stranger. It talks about the fatherless and also the widow that, has, that are within our gates. Meaning that you cannot, you know, you cannot stand wherever you're staying and even within your home and not see someone who actually needs uh, needs your help. They are always there with us and we will always see someone within our gates who we can extend a hand to and minister to. The needy we always have. We cannot say we don't have them. They are always there. It only takes uh, uh, a quick look, not even a, a, a keen one, a quick one, then you will see them. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 5 and verse 17 to 26. It's a lengthy passage, so we may not read it here. But we see a very powerful story, you know, um, that Dr. Luke tells us uh, about an encounter that Jesus had with four men. Were they four? Yes. Yes, four men and their friend, making them five people. Their friend who was sick and incapable and in need of healing. And they knew that the, the room was filled with the throng there are so many people in the in the in the, there was a multitude that christ was addressing and and ministering to and they, they knew for sure that christ had the power to heal their friend but they did not know how to take the friend to christ all right and um and so this this section is aptly uh, you know entitled the faith of friends yeah. These four friends had faith in Christ, and they knew Christ could save their friend. And we are told a beautiful story of how they went and made an opening on the roof and used some straps, you know, to lower the, the sick friend of theirs down from the roof right at the feet of Jesus on the stage. And Christ was impressed by their faith. And because of their faith, their friend was healed. Yes. I want us to talk a little about that. Mm. One of the things that uh, I want us to underscore is that uh, they, they did not just have mere concern for their friend, for their sick friend. They had deep love. Mm. And that love made, led them to do unconventional things. You know, the conventional thing is uh, you take your friend at your convenience, when you're available, if you're not available, say, ah, I'm not available, can you call so-and-so who is available? And then you take them to a hospital, and you take them to one that you can afford, you know, and then you some, perhaps just dump them there, and, you know, convenience. But the unconventional is the one that goes beyond, beyond convenience. And these guys had even... I don't, I don't even know what material that roof was made of. But if my mind serves me right, then I, I tend to imagine that that material was a slab. Because back in, there, back in those days, there were flat roofs. And if someone could go up on the rooftop and just relax. And if it was a rooftop, kind of a, build, a, a building with a rooftop, that meant that the roof was actually a slab. In my imagination. I don't want to imagine it was only... They, they must have used damas. <laughs> Pardon? They must have used damas to, to <laughs> knock it off. Yes. They must have used chisels and yeah. hammers and, yeah. and crude things to just knock off the... And I wonder how long that took them. What effort, what determination. Then finally... And you know, it, was, it wasn't like a small hole that they were drilling. 
they were excavating a whole, you know, portion of the roof that a whole human being, <laughs> a sick one yeah. who cannot bend and move their body, could be lowered down to. I don't want to go into the details of that, but just imagine, uh, dear viewer, how that 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 kind of uh, sacrifice was. It was an unconventional. The other thing is they also must have been very, you know, innovative. And we're going to talk about innovation. What is the place of innovation in the ministry to the needy or the ministry to, to our friends today? I want Mercy yeah. to go first. What is your thoughts? What are your thoughts about uh, the faith of our friends? The faith of our friends, indeed, it can save us all. And uh, since we are on a mission, we are being called upon to have this kind of faith that uh, we need to stand in the gap for our friends. Yeah, we need to know who, are, who our friends are and uh, not to, to select, to be general in choosing our friends, be there for them, be there for one another, and uh, just to go extra mile. You see what they did, uh, it was extra. Yeah, just going there on top, it took a lot of time for sure because uh, for you to get someone from on top of the roof until down, it, it must have taken time. So they were really patient enough. So we need to be patient with each other and uh, to be ready to deliver the mission of God, to save a soul, to be there for one another. Because our faith is there to save our friends, the friends that Christ wants us to have, the real friends, not just being their friends in good times. We need to be there for one another even in bad times. Like this guy, he was seriously sick because I can imagine that he was lying on a bed. It means he must have been so, so sick. Even so the responsibility walk. that the friends took, they took that responsibility and uh, they just wanted that Christ because they knew the power of Christ and they had the faith that if Christ could just touch, could just see that their friend is going to be healed. So we also need to trust in God. We also need to know that our God is so powerful and that he's able to do much more than we expect or than that which others are expect of him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Mercy. God is able and it is a faith that they had in the Lord that drove them. Yeah. Now, Frank, yes. I know you have a comment, but I want you to answer this even as you give your comment. Yeah. What was so urgent? In this case, what, what was wrong with these guys? Were they out of their mind? What was so urgent? Could they just to wait for the crowd to dissipate and to clear off? And then the Savior would, at some point, Christ was going to be alone. What was so urgent that made them to excavate a whole roof so, so that they can drop this guy? Yeah, you know, when you, when you realize the, uh, that salvation, the Bible tells us that the day of salvation is now. And... Uh, the agency of the friends, they saw that, you know, like, if we don't do it now, we might miss the opportunity to have our friend, uh, like, saved. And so even for us, when we go out there, we need to do all that is within our power and not wait for a, a more convenient season for someone to, you know, to get the pardoning and uh, the ministration of Christ. If they can get relieved now, you know, there are people that are in hospitals that, you know, they are struggling with the guilt. And we are not assured that they will overcome the guilt tomorrow. And our only safety for them is to extend the call today. And so these friends, they could not wait to, you know, for any other convenient time. They were not sure that they would get another opportunity. Probably they had been waiting for Christ to come to town. And when Christ came to town, Christ went to minister you know, like the the mob swabbed him, and so they were like, "We don't have any other opportunity. It is now." And I think it's the urgency uh, that even us, as we go out to to minister, we shouldn't wait for a convenient season when we can introduce Christ to others. We should do it now while it is. Actually, told that there's this verse that says, "I don't know if you can help me find it now." Today, if you hear His, his voice, voice, harden not your heart. Yeah, today, sure. today. Yes, yes. I, I think it should be Hebrews 4, verse 7. Thank you. And Isaiah also tells us, chapter 1, I think verse 8, uh, 18, come now. Yeah, come now, yes. And, and let, let us, us reason together. together. Not come tomorrow, come now. Exactly. Now. And, and Christ tells us that, you know, like, work while it is still day, mm -hmm. when there is that opportunity for yeah. men to, to come to Christ. Let us, like, labor as though today, you know, is the last, the last. day. Yeah. 
Yeah. I want someone to give me a, a quick answer to this one. How do you bring your helpless friends to Christ? Mercy. How, how, what are some of the ways that you today can apply these principles here and just bring your friends to Christ? First, I'll act. Yes. I'll act immediately without even questioning. Yeah, and the faith that I have in Christ will move me because I know what Christ has done to me even in the past, even what Christ is able to do. So we need to act with faith in so there action. So there is faith as a prerequisite, but yes. that faith must lead you to what? To action. action. Sure. Even as you act, there needs to be some patience. Yes. Remember them excavating the roof? Patience, you know? And then there's a willingness, if need be, to be unconventional, to go against the grain. Yeah. What are some of the unconventional ways you think we can take the gospel? The ones that are beyond what we, we normally do. You know, when, uh, when, first of all, when we talk about like uh, faith and action, there is a verse in uh, James 2, verse 17, you know, that tells us that faith without works is dead. So it joins works and faith at the heap. Then now we go ahead and Christ tells us in Matthew 5, verse 43, that you have heard it being said that you do this, but I tell you, do this way. Christ is telling us that, you know, there are conventional ways in which you've had, you know, uh, ministry being done. But he's not telling us to do that. In fact, when you look at the book of uh, Luke 6.33, he says that, you know, you've been, you've been told that you should only do good to those that, those that you know, those that love you back, those that will give you something in return. But he's telling us that, for me, I'm telling you, do it this way. He's giving us another way to, to do things. He's telling us, be unconventional in how you reach people. There are places where you will go where the word of God is not readily... Uh, you know, like welcomed, and people are not. There's a lot of risk that comes with doing such kind of work, and that calls us to be very creative in how we 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 bring the the word to the people, so that the word is not rejected because of how we brought it to the people, but we should be creative. Uh, one of the ways for me I've I've done it is uh, I I I went to minister like in chaplaincy to a school that didn't have like any Adventist presence. And the students there, they just come because uh, we offer, you know, we offer them lunch uh, on a Sabbath. So that's one of the ways, you know, offering them lunch. Mm. But also beyond offering them lunch, we also offer ourselves to, to teach them, you know, take them through some of the subjects at the school. And now we are even, you know, like providing them with literature that is not uh, like, you know, Christian literature. But we are offering them like, you know, books as well. So sometimes you get, you know, opportunity to contribute for school fees for some of the students. Those are unconventional ways. It not, it's not the normal way of going in and just preaching someone's. Thank you. Uh, I remember that reminds me of when I was youth leader and uh, we, we, we wanted to, we were looking for very unconventional ways. And I think this topic came up very well uh, and prominently to us. It was a burden to us. How do we minister to the, dweller, the dwellers of this city? You know, and um, and we went, we went, we came up with this matatu, matatu evangelism. Yes. I don't know if you have heard about it. And uh, ever since, I think New Life Youth have been doing matatu evangelism every year. And we took uh, Steps to Christ, Great Controversy, and several other books. And we could go into a matatu and just, you know, distribute the books and answer questions and, and pray with those who needed prayers along the way. It took, it took, you know, paying even, uh, we had to pay fares for those who are going to do this. And they're going to directions that they don't reside in those places. They have no business to transact in those places. But they are going there just for the sake of whoever is going to listen to them in this particular uh, matatu. If you're watching outside Kenya, a matatu is a means of transport here in Kenya. <laughs> All right. Now, this is very interesting. Um, um, uh, let me just uh, read out uh, uh, something here. Jesus himself demonstrates how to help the helpless in calling us to do the same. First, we become their friends. Mm. Because you cannot, uh, you know, minister to someone who has not welcomed you as a friend. Yes. And then we learn about their needs because you cannot address needs that you do not know. You must, first of all, appreciate that Morris has this type of need and this is, this is, this is, this is the, the way I should ad address it. And then we lead them to Jesus, who is the only one who can help them. Amen? Yes. And mercy. 
what are your thoughts about Christ's method? Uh, Frank has been alluding to it. Frank has been alluding to it, uh, you know, starting with addressing the needs, physical needs, then the spiritual needs. But what are your deep thoughts when you are going through this section uh, about Christ's method? Yeah, Christ method alone, what drew my attention here is uh, there is a way Christ wind and how Christ stood and to the needs of the people. Because we realized, we have realized that we cannot say that there is no need around us at every point. There are so much opportunity and you said that it will just be a quick response. Just outside our door, always there is a need. And uh, this one, we get it from the book of John, John 5, 1 to 9. Uh, we are not going to read the whole of it, but uh, it was talking about a man who was ill at the pool of Bethsaida. Yeah, and the steps that uh, Christ method alone used here, we realize that he mingled with them. As you are saying that we need to make friends. Yeah, for us to minister, we mingle with each other so that we be friends. Because for someone to open up to you, you need to be friend first. So you need to mingle. That is means we come close to them. And uh, after that one, we will show sympathy without expecting any return. That is, um, we meet their need. We start meeting their need. We start understanding them and uh, not to expect any return from them because remember that they are in need. Yeah, so there is no, no, no return for it. It is a mission. And also, we minister to their needs. That is uh, by empathizing now. That is now we come in kind. Uh, if it is, uh, like Frank said, maybe helping in paying the school fees, now we're coming. If it is uh, sharing a meal, we're coming. If it is buying literature or buying any material for them, we come in. That is uh, step three. And then winning their confidence. We need to win their confidence. And uh, this comes in by showing them that your way is, uh, is the right way because they will not trust you. They will not have confidence in you if they are going to doubt you. So out of your past interaction with them and reaching out to them and just being there for them and understanding their needs and being there for them, now we, we are going to win confidence in return. And also we lead them to Christ. That is by teaching them and uh, showing them just the love of Christ. Remember, all this process is all about Christ's love because we realize that uh, we cannot also give what we don't have. So we are required to have this love of Christ in us because remember, we are on a mission, and the mission is of Christ. We are just uh, in partnership with Christ. We are just collaborators. We are just working with Christ, and Christ is in it. Christ is with us in it. So he is going to direct us and is going to continue leading us and to help us to meet the needs of these people, even using his method alone. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I was watching a, 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 a short clip today about, uh, uh, you know, the thoughts of uh, uh, Elder C.D. Brooks on this subject. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, uh, it's important for us to first appeal to the intellect and then to the emotions. Uh, but but if we appeal to the emotions alone, like some evangelicals love to do, and people fail to appreciate intellectually what we are talking about, then it's a mission in futility because we will hypnotize them and make them cry, and uh, you know even make them sometimes fall down with spirits that are not are not uh, of God, um, uh, and, and 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 then end up uh, you know not changing them, giving them a life changing, uh, you know. Uh, you know, experience, but just a mere experiential type of worship is not enough to save a soul. Um, Ellen White says in Ministry of Healing, as I allow you to chime in, uh, Brother Frank, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Mm -hmm. He showed his sympathy for them ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. And I think Brother Sister Mercy has outlined the five, the famous five steps of Christ's alone, Christ's method alone. Would you like to add something to it? Yeah, I think for me, the verse that uh, comes to mind is uh, Mark 10, uh, verses 45, uh, which says, I think this is sort of like the basis of Mark's gospel. And Mark says that, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister 
and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, he's telling us that, you know, Christ's work was to minister, which means he was a servant. So we need to start with service to people before we even get into, you know, like the uh, offering, you know, like our lives to them. You know, that's kind of sacrifice that we give to them. And so for us as well, we need to do whatever Christ did. You know, he's telling us that uh, if we do not really have like sympathy for people, if we do not visit with people, if we do not talk to people, if we do not pray for people, uh, then we are not going to win hearts. We are going to be, our work will not be attended by much success. We need to get in, you know, and do the personal labor and uh, pray for souls and talk to people and listen to their problems. And that way God will work uh, with with us, you know, like mightily. And it also means that, you know, Christ mingled with men, meaning that he did not just send people. He also did the work himself. He ministered. He was a servant to all. And that tells us that this work, as we've said uh, previously, it cannot be done in proxy. We have to be there. We have to be hands-on, you know, like missionaries ministering to the needy. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, just, are... just to add, is, it is going going in the field itself yeah. and uh, action is needed. We are not going to sit and preach the gospel. It is now time to go out, go out in the field, interact with them, be there for them, even stay with them. Like a uh, pre-mission visit, I've, uh, I've, I've done it. You go into a village or into a location and you study that environment, you see how they do things, what they eat, you mingle with those people so that you understand even their challenges, their needs, and uh, their expectation, so that you start making friends. You start making friends with the people. Thank you very much. And this is, this is actually what um, social researchers, uh, known as uh, uh, you know, ethnographers, you know, normally do. They go into uh, a particular locality, and they study the culture and the ways of lives of those people. And they, they take notes over a period of time and they collect data through that. And, and they are able to make, uh, you know, adjustments, deductions, and, and be able to, to, to draw, draw conclusions. But look at, look at the, the life of the Waldenses, all right? Even the Waldenses did exactly what Sister Mercy has just described because they knew that it was politically incorrect you know, even for them to speak some, 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 some type of message. They bore the message. They had the Bibles, but they kept it under their garments. And they went and disguised themselves, you know, in, in, in far lands, away from their, 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 you know, the, the feet of the mountain where they lived. And they were sent, after being thoroughly trained in the word of God, they were sent as young people to go and, uh, and preach this, 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 this message. But they were not going to preach it uh, in the open because they knew that would call for their death or even their execution. So what would they do? They would hide the Bible. They would go and disguise themselves as selling things. Of course, they sold things and they got to make friends with the, with the people, learn their ways and so on and so forth. And to the hearts that the Holy Spirit led them to and that they felt were receptive, yeah. you know, they started giving small portions of the Bible, little by little. And as they kept, uh, uh, you know, receiving the word, so the Spirit led and converted many people through that method. Now, that brings us to refugees and immigrants, people who are looked down upon, people who are segregated, people who are outsiders and rejects. And it is politically sometimes incorrect to associate yourselves with a refugee from a particular country because that would mean that you are in support of that country even though you're just trying to minister to them. How would you, what are your thoughts, uh, uh, Frank, in how the church today can take advantage of the many refugee camps that we have and the many immigrants that we have into our, in our countries and minister to them and show them Christ? Yes, I think uh, God introduces us to this ministry to the stranger uh, and he's telling the Israelites, you know, like... Uh, you are refugees. When you read uh, Deuteronomy 10, verses 19, he says you are, you are strangers in Egypt. And so he asks them to show kindness to the, to the stranger. And I just want us to read from uh, Deuteronomy 24, uh, 17 and 18, where it says, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, 
nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that you were bondmen uh, in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you thence. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And God is commanding us, he's calling us today, you know, uh, as we've said, uh, there are people within, you know, like our, our societies who are marginalized. They are strangers. And there are, are these people who are also like gravely misunderstood. But God is asking us to, you know, draw near to those kind of people. The people who are misunderstood, those who are most in need of our help. The people who are, you know, uh, when you look at our world today is highly like, you know, polarized and people have nationalistic tendencies. We see the war that is going on in, uh, in like uh, Israel and, and Palestine. And God is calling us to, you know, stand up for those kind of people. And even Kenya, you know, like uh, earlier on uh, in the last decade, we had uh, uh, the war that was going on between, you know, Kenya and Somali. In, in such kind of uh, situations, it would even be, you know, like uh, you would be jeopardizing your life to even associate uh, with, you know, like uh, someone from Somali, they would say you are uh, you're colluding with them, you're complicit in uh, the kind of work they're doing, and you're not patriotic to your country. And it also reminds me, you know, of uh, during the, uh, the Second World War, during uh, the Nazi Holocaust, when the Jews were greatly persecuted. And, and a story that I was, I was reading, I uh, was talking about, you know, when Hitler went into, into Austria and he took over Vienna, and the Adventists who were in Vienna actually celebrated uh, that Hitler had come and overthrown, uh, overthrown the government. Why? Because for them, the government had been strongly Catholic. And for them, they saw, you know, like Hitler taking over the government as, as you know, victory against the Catholics. And, and, and we, see, we saw whatever happened, you know, with the, with the Jews, like in, in Vienna, for example. And there was an Adventist uh, who was a Jewish, you know, a Jewish Adventist. He went into, into one of the churches and... Uh, he asked the Adventist church to, to help him and protect him from the Holocaust. And they told him that, you know, we cannot offer you help. Go to the Jewish community in Vienna. They are the ones who will, who will offer you the help. And, and at a time when the church could have stood for him at that moment, they did not. It was a perfect opportunity for yeah, the church it, to minister to him. Exactly. And they lost it. Yeah, and, and you know, like, uh, we, we, we tend to see that when it is unpopular to stand with others who are being persecuted, who are being marginalized, that is when Christ calls us to, you know, like show a little, even a little more courage for them. And even we do not need to, you know, to live in a, in a, in a, in a regime that persecutes people. Even in our current societies, in our cities, in our churches, there will be those people who we can stand up for. The minorities that are always looked down upon, that it would be politically incorrect to stand with them. Those, those are the people that, you know, uh, there's, there's an Adventist author called uh, Daniel Haynes, and he was asking a question that, could we have done more for the Jews during the Holocaust? And I think when we internalize that, we realize that there are so many more people in our churches today that there's a lot more that we could do for them. Yes, indeed. And that, that, that points us straight, before I come to you, Marcy, to our key text, which you did not read, but now we are reading. Matthew 25, verse 40. This is what it says. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And that, that, that is exactly what uh, Brother Frank has uh, aptly you know, described. The least of my brethren, the least of these, uh, the ones that are most, uh, mostly you know, out, out, considered as outcasts, you know, uh, looked down upon and discriminated against and people fear today if i went and um, you know there's a, if there was a you know a, a, for example a terrorist attack in nairobi and 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 for example the al shabab you know t- takes ownership as they normally do that yes. we are responsible then i would uh, then i go to that very very camp where i think the al shabab are or i get one of them and then i take them food tell them hey sorry my brother i'm praying for you sorry for for you know i, I don't know for whatever but uh, please i'm ministering to them and the media would catch me you know ministering to them the next day i would be in jail you know yes i would be in jail because i would be viewed as a sympathizer to an to an enemy whereas i am just going to minister to them now 
even as we minister mercy mm. to the refugees and immigrants, and this is just a term, these refugees and immigrants, I think it's just a general term that we should use to mean those who are politically, uh, you know, uh, sidelined. Yes. It can be any group, but as we minister to them, sometimes it calls for us to be tactful yeah. and not to be headstrong. Mm. Say, I'm mm. doing it in the name of Jesus. You know, <laughs> God calls us to be, you know, he says, I send you among the wolves. Mm. Yeah. You need to be as humble as a dove. As, as a dove or as a sheep, it but be as, as wise as the as serpent. Snake, as now, is that cunningness, is that, is that wisdom that will help us to preserve, not really preserve our lives, but help us to take this message to a longer, for a longer time to more people and not dying immediately after we deliver the first message? Matthew, what do you think? Yeah, indeed, uh, we need, uh, we are required to be more humble. And uh, even as we reach out, uh, remember we are reaching out to the needy and uh, it is our responsibility to reach out unto them. And uh, we, we are going beyond uh, ethnic boundaries here even as we look at unto it. So we need to just humble ourselves enough and even to be more prayerful. We are not going to, to be in this, I call it a battlefield alone or with our own strength. We need to ask of God's strength. So we need to ask God's presence and let us know that the Holy Spirit is with us because Christ promised this in Matthew 28 that I will leave you. You are not going to be alone. Yeah, so there is a promise and there is the presence of the Holy Spirit which is leading us. So we just need to be more prayerful and to reach out because Reaching out, uh, let us not be biased. Let us not reach out onto just our own people, but let us go beyond the boundaries and uh, reach out even unto these who have been displaced, even by politics or by wars, because they, we should be there for one another. Thank you. Yeah. Here's a very, a very straightforward answer. Begin with the prayer. Okay. Always, yes. always begin with prayer. Then seek information on, on immigrants and refugees. Many places have organizations that care for them. You can begin working with one of these organizations or maybe your local church Sabbath school could start a ministry for immigrants or refugees. Amen? Amen. 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 Frank. Yes. There are many people who are hurting today. You just mentioned, you, make, you made reference to, to the war uh, in uh, Palestine and Israel. But even right now, there's another war that is not yet ended between Russia and Ukraine. Yes. But these are just the major ones that we hear and see in the international media. There are smaller, you know, ethnic clashes and uh, civil wars and, and unrests and upheavals, you know, yes. that, are, 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 that are replete, you know, in almost this, almost this whole globe. You go to South America, you will see some sort of unrest. You go to Australia, you see some sort of unrest. In Africa, there are so many. You know, there is the, the, you know, the coups that have been happening lately in West Africa. And people are actually losing their lives, even though the international media may not focus so much on them. Now, what is a special place? What is our special calling, you know, as a people or as a people of God to minister to these people who are hurting, these people who are in distress? Yes. Thank you. I think uh, before I segue into that, there's also the other thing about, you know, bringing this home. Even before we go into, you know, the people in the, in the, in the foreign war fields and, and all that, how do we even treat, you know, like our domestic workers, for example? Those are also people we need to think about, you know. People could be having, undergoing different kind of challenges and they might have from time to time the opportunity to stay with us. How do we treat them when they're in such kind of situations. Uh, but I want to just transition to, you know, those that are hurting. And uh, we see people, like, you know, people get, you know, like, into different kinds of uh, situations from, you know, it could be suffering, they could be struggling financially, uh, they could be undergoing depression, uh, they could be lacking, you know, the basic necessities of life. Uh, there are also people who are, you know, like, deceased. Uh, I was reading somewhere and they were talking about, you know, like people who are diagnosed with cancer, for example. And uh, we're told that they, when you are diagnosed with cancer, you, you, you seem to enter into, you know, a borderless medical gulag. You know, every system, uh, your heart, your blood, 
your lungs, they, they, they are working at the knife edge of their performance. And these kinds of people, they need to be listened to. You know, they need to be counseled. They need to be uh, given uh, therapy. There are, there are people who are in, you know, like uh, nursing homes, uh, maybe for the ed- elderly. There are people who have terminal illnesses. And uh, I think a lot of the time we delegate this to charities. We delegate this to, you know, like uh, established and organized committees to take care of them. Uh, but... God is asking us to be in the shoes of those who are hurting. Just being there to listen to them, not even running to provide solutions. Some people can donate money. You know, we think that throwing around our money, opening our purses and our wallets uh, does the job, but that's not enough. We need to op- open much more than just our hearts and our wallets. Our money sometimes is not enough. We have to be there. We have to, you know, it must cost us something to minister to people. There is the costly sharing of our of our time for those who are uh, who are uh, in need, even beyond the the circles of our friends. And one of the verses that I that really got me thinking when I was thinking about you know like ministry to the hurting uh, is Luke six verses uh, should be uh, verses nineteen, which tells us that you know when Christ ministered to the people, virtue actually left him and went into the other people. You remember the, the, the woman who touched the hem of his garment. He said, virtue has actually has left, left me. me. Yeah. It cost him something to, to, you know, he shared his time, he shared his resources. And for us as well, it needs to, we need to go beyond just the occasional discomfort uh, in the easy things that we can provide and the sharing of the extra that we have, but actually being cost in terms of like our time a lot of time is needed in this ministry, in this personal labor. We need to go into service, you know, uh, our energy. We have to be drained for others to get relief from, their, yes. from their problems. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mercy, what are your thoughts in ministering to, to the needy? We are, we are learning that it must actually cost us something. It is not going to be something we do at ease. It, in, in Christ's uh, uh, case, it costs him both time and virtue and ultimately his life. Yes. All right? You remember when he, it was his custom to once in a while retreat at his friend Lazarus's place and he could stay there with them. And I believe they're not just staying there in idle talk. They were a blessed family because Christ was their friend. Yes. Imagine. If Christ is your friend to an extent that he comes to visit you physically out of the many families that he knew. So that was a, another way of just ministering to them, going to spend the time with them. And when, uh, when Lazarus passed away, he came personally, yeah. even though he was four days late, but it was not too late. What are your thoughts? Very quickly, because we are coming to, to yeah. the, to, we are yeah. going to the last part of this. Yeah, Christ is still on time and uh, he's never late. It is never too late, even on the mission of Christ. When Christ is in it, let us always remember that uh, we are not late for the Christ mission. And uh, just, uh, we need to be selfless. The, we, there is a need for selfless love. That is, uh, even that we get it even when we read John fifteen thirteen, and uh, it says, that greater love has no one than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends. Amen. So we are expected to reach that point because Christ desire that our, our, our caring, our mission for the needy and for others, let it be out of self-love. Let us be selfless. Let us surrender this love that Christ has given us freely. Remember Christ died for us on the throne just that even if it was only one sinner, he was able to to save for the salvation of mankind. So when we remember all this, we need to know that Christ is there for us and he offered everything. He emptied heaven. We said it at the beginning, that Christ emptied heaven just for the sake of our salvation. And this is the love that is required of us, even as we go out to minister and to the needs of everyone, and uh, meeting out to the needs of our friends, even our neighbors, everyone. Our mission should not be with boundaries. We should not have boundary like uh, I can only reach to my friends, my family members. It should go out. It should go beyond. It, sh- it is beyond what we can imagine of. 
we need to go out there minister and to those people who even do not deserve it because even Christ went went he went to the most to the most and the list of this uh, the list of this yes. so we have a very big duty ahead of us and uh, let us remember that Christ is with us on this mission and that we are not alone we are never alone there is a song that say that we are never alone, alone. God uh, because is God is with us so Christ is with us on this mission and let us just reach out to the needs of our friends, of our enemies, of those who are in need, everyone around the world, L let us not have boundaries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Interdenominational or interreligious uh, 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 ministry appeal. I want you to draw a distinction between this. Where do where does the what's the place of ecumenism? Because I have a friend who 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 is really upbeat about inter religious you know interreligious uh, associations yes i will not mention his name but he, he champions for it and he actually works but partially for for the interreligious uh, uh, council of kenya irck and, and 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 his idea is that you know as adventists we need to be open to you know to listen to other people and get to hear their ideas because we worship the same god apparently we may not not be worshiping the same god as the hindus yes. or as the muslims but yes that is his, 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 his thinking now Masi has very very clearly pointed out that we need to open up the borders in fact the story that we're given here of one missionary family that served six years in Trinidad and tobago mm. and uh, and they, they even used to visit their their hindu friends mm. and and attend their thanksgiving ceremonies and through that they could get inroads and be able to you know minister to them in other ways now how do you draw the distinction why do you draw the line between associ associ associating with them for the for the sake of ministry and Oh, and being unequally yoked with them. Yes, I think uh, when we go out, we go with the truth. And uh, Christ is asking us to, you know, we should not, you know, uh, we should go into all the houses. And he's asking us, you know, like we start at Jerusalem and then to the all, uh, all the nations of the world. And Christ knows that, you know, he has other sheep out there who are not of this fold and he wants to bring them in. For us, it should be, you know, by being hospitable by showing that we care about people genuinely, even before we, we tell them our truth, that is an entering wedge into us uh, sharing the message of God. And so we're being called to, you know, like, let's go out and uh, spend ourselves in ministering to others, regardless of, you know, their persuasions. And when we share the truth, they will be convicted to the truth. It will not profit us to just go to the people who will be agreeable to us. That is not the call that, uh, that Christ is giving us. And uh, just to read from Matthew 5, verse 46, it says, For if we love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Christ is asking us, what do we do more than others? And I think doing more than others doesn't mean that we compromise on the truth. But teach the truth, and the truth will convict uh, the man. Amen. Yeah, and it's not among, it's not for us to to go out and you know like uh, say that we will not interact with others because they are not of our persuasion. True. True. Yeah. We cannot keep ourselves in our comfort zones, and we cannot fear because God Christ says, "Go out, yes. and baptize all." You know. Yeah. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy, and I'm with you. To the end. Now, this this quarter's lesson is very unique, even as we come to an end. And I like I like the fact that every Thursday we have a challenge and a challenge up. Mm, yes. I don't know if you've noticed that. And yeah. and I've been trying to practice some of this uh, uh, challenge and challenge up with my lesson class somewhere there. Mm. And, and 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 it's very beautiful when you try it. It's very challenging yeah. uh, because it's a challenge actually. So let let me read for you the challenge and then the challenge up. And then we try to do it. Even our listeners, our viewers online, try to pick up this challenge and try to practice it so that we make this lesson practical and at the end of this quarter at least we, 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 will, we will say that we have drawn some, some souls to Christ. So the challenge this week is learn about foreigners or non-Christians who live in your country. You know, joshuaprojects.net is a good place to survey and reach people, groups in your culture. Then that is the challenge. Get to learn about them. Who, who is that neighbor who is a foreigner? We have a lot of foreigners in Kenya, you know, who just some of them just live very close to us. Uh, they may not necessarily be bad people. They may, be, they may not be Adventists at the same time. 
but you just need to learn about them. What are their cultures? What are their, what are their needs? How do they view life? What's their worldview? You know? And then challenge up. Identify someone within your sphere of influence. Begin regularly praying for that person after answering the following questions. Number one, is this person my friend? According to Jesus' model of friendship, do I know the need of his or her life? That means you have kept them close as a friend and you've known their needs. You've learned a thing or two about them. And then lastly, how can I lead him or her to Jesus for healing? It might not be physical healing, but a spiritual healing. Amen? Amen. So those are our challenges this um, this week, the challenge and the challenge up. And I believe that the Lord is going to help us to make good his work. Yeah, for sure. Christ is going to help us to to make this into realistic because he has said that let us pray and ask God for help. And let us know that he knows everyone and he knows even those strangers whom we are supposed to reach unto. Thank you very much. Frank, what are your last thoughts in half a minute? And then uh, uh, we'll ask Sister Mercy to close with the word of prayer. Yes, I think for us is just to know that uh, there will be the needy amongst us and Christ is calling us to, you know, like, let's give ourselves beyond just the easy giving, but to be spent the same way Christ was spent uh, for the ministry and the cause of others. Amen. Mercy. Yes. Amen. Thank you so very much. Indeed, uh, always there is a need around us. We just need to to have the the eyes, our eyes wide open, because Christ will lead us unto these groups of people. Let us believe and pray. Eternal Father, most gracious God, what in heaven. Dear God, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath morning. We thank you for leading us through the study of the lesson. And we thank you even for pointing us unto the needs and unto the needy who are amongst us, O oh my God. How we pray that we may put this into action, that we may continue to reach out because you have put us in this world with a purpose. And so may you are, may your purpose be fulfilled through us, oh my God, as we left ourselves to be used of you for honor and glory of your name. Bless us throughout this Sabbath day programs until the end, for it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Amen.